Amen. That's a lot of good news, isn't it? A lot to be grateful for. And I might add just one other report that uh, last weekend, Easter Sunday, in addition to the people who came in person at, uh, on our Oak Hills campus at Crown Ridge, we had some 40,000 people worship with us around the world online. That's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? And so wherever you are in the world, we're so very, very grateful to invite you to begin this uh, seven-week study that we kick off today uh, based on the book of Romans. In his fine book entitled Creatures of Habit, Steve Poe relates the story of a young girl who fell asleep while driving over a bridge in East Los Angeles. She hit the guardrail, her car flipped, and she was left dangling several hundred feet in the air, suspended only by her rear left tire. It took rescuers about two and a half hours to pull her to safety. She was held in the car only by her seatbelt. Now, one of the rescuers said that during the entire rescue operation of two and a half hours, she kept saying over and over aloud, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. Now, no doubt she was dazed. No doubt she was incoherent. No doubt she was confused. But no doubt she was wrong. She could not do it herself. She needed an outside source. She needed a rescuer. She needed somebody to come in and do for her what she could not do for herself. The same is true for us. The same is true for us. The crimson thread that works its way throughout Scripture is the promise of God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He comes to save us. This is called grace. And God seeks to correct this curious self-sufficiency, this curious propensity that we have to save ourselves, at least attempt to save ourselves, in a variety of ways through the Scripture. But no epistle advances the cause of grace more than the one we open today, and that is the book of Romans. We're going to study the book of Romans over the next seven weeks under the title, God's Great Grace. I first fell in love with the book of Romans way back in the early 1980s when I was serving on a church staff in Miami, Florida. And our senior minister always said, when you get Romans, God gets you. I pray you get Romans so that God can have even more of you. Today we turn our attention to the first three chapters. Let's pray and then we'll get to work. Gracious God, how good of you, how good of you not to call upon us to save ourselves, but to send a Savior to save us. We beg for mercy and forgiveness for those times when we, out of our own pride and self-sufficiency, think that we can either work our way to heaven or compare our way to heaven or deny even our need for heaven, we beg you, Lord, to have mercy upon us. Now, as we open this word, as we open this scripture, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray you'd forgive our teacher. His sins are many. Help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. Amen. True heroes are hard to identify. They don't always look like heroes. Take the Apostle Paul, for example. There are many times when we look at his life that his story is more harrowing than it is heroic. Two decades of travel and trouble planting churches. And what does he have to show for it? Well, there's trouble in Philippi. There's squabbling in Corinth. Legalists are questioning the gospel in Galatia. Money grabbers are plaguing Crete. Many of his own friends have turned against him. He's had his moments. His missionary journeys have spread the gospel throughout the then known world, debating philosophers in Athens. He's been a part of a jailbreak in Philippi. He even witnessed a boy being brought back to life in the city of Troas. 
But the misfortunes, well, they far outpaced the successes. He's been rounded up for execution more than once. He's been stranded in several cities. He's been beaten with rods on numerous occasions. It seems like if he stayed for longer than a week in any one place, it's because he was in jail. He never received a salary. He always had a part-time job on the side to make ends meet. No, Paul never looked like a hero. Certainly nobody in his day would have ever imagined that 2,000 years later, we would still be considering his letters. And certainly no one would have ever imagined that that Saul who became Paul would pen letters that would have a profound impact on the Western world. Perhaps no single letter that he wrote has had more impact in shaping our Christian doctrine than the one that we're about to discuss, the one this beleaguered apostle penned to a group of believers in the city of Rome. Let's set the scene. The year is A.D. 57. Almost 30 years have passed since Jesus' resurrection and the birth of the church. Paul has been on his third missionary journey. He's been visiting churches that he previously planted in Asia Minor. His journeys have taken him from the city of Antioch in Syria to the villages of Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and then to Ephesus, where he ministers for more than two years. Ultimately, there was a riot in the city of Ephesus. It forced him to journey on to the region of Macedonia, where he visits churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, before arriving in Corinth. It's there that the Apostle Paul experiences a three-month lull in his travels. But even though his feet are grounded, he can feel that familiar stirring of the Holy Spirit calling him to go into a place where he has never gone, taking the gospel where the gospel has never been heard. This new region, he decides, will be Spain. The city of Rome is en route to Spain, and so he decides to make a stop to visit the Christians there and hopefully drum up some support for this missionary journey into the far-off country of Spain. The problem is the Apostle Paul is a bit of a controversial figure. He's known to stir things up. He never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> so what he decides to do is send an advance letter to explain and clarify the gospel that the Lord has given to him. He just wants to set the record straight. And so he calls for his friend and scribe Tertius to come. He collects his thoughts and he begins the letter like this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What follows from our hero Paul is one of the clearest and most profound presentations of the Christian doctrine that has ever been presented. But the apostle Paul does not do so from the posture of a hero. He will often remind his readers that he is the chief among sinners. Paul is clear as he writes that he never forgot the fact that he was a Christian killer before he became a Christian leader. At times, his heart seems so heavy that it seems like his pen just drags across the page. Even in this epistle, he will say, what a wretched man that I am. Heaven only knows how long he stared at that question before he found the courage to defy logic and say, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Paul and for the book of Romans, the hero is not the apostle. The hero is the Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Paul understood his condition. And he also understood the reality of the human condition. He recognized that in the algebra of heaven, the equation reads something like this. Heaven is a perfect place for perfect people, which leaves each of us in a perfect mess. He knew that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. And since the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, all of us rightly deserve death. There's nothing we can do to cover up our sins. We're all clothed in our tattered garments of sin. When I think about this, it reminds me of a suit I used to wear. It was an elegant ensemble, complete with coat, trousers, even a hat. I considered myself quite dapper in the outfit. I was confident that others agreed. The pants were cut from the cloth of my good works. Sturdy fabric of deeds done and projects completed. Oh my goodness, what an impressive person I was. The trousers, why the trousers were my perfect understanding of scripture. I often hitched them up in public so people would see the coat was equally impressive. It was woven together from my convictions. Each day I dressed myself in my garb of religious fervor. My emotions were so strong, so strong that I was often asked to model my coat of zeal in public gatherings and inspire other people. Of course, I was happy to comply. While there, I would display my hat, my feathered cap of knowledge formed with my own hands from the fabric of personal opinion. But over time, my wardrobe began to suffer. The fabric of my trousers grew thin. My best works were coming unstitched. I was leaving more undone than done, and what I did was nothing to boast about. I resolved to solve the problem by working harder, but I soon came to learn that it was trying to work harder that was the cause of the problem. There was a hole in the coat of my convictions. My resolve became threadbare. A cold wind cut into my chest. I reached up to pull my hat down and the brim ripped off in my hands. My wardrobe of self-righteousness had unraveled completely. And I went from a tailored gentleman's apparel to beggar's rags. And I feared that God would be angry, angry at my tattered suit. I did my best to stitch it up and cover my mistakes, but the cloth was so worn and the wind was so icy. Finally, I gave up. And on a wintry afternoon, I stepped into his presence and my prayer was feeble. I feel naked, I said to him. You are, he answered. And you have been for a long time. But then he said, I've got something to give you. And he gently removed my remaining threads and he picked up a regal robe. The clothing of his own goodness and he wrapped it around my shoulders and his words were tender my child you are now clothed with Christ this is grace this is grace maybe I'm talking to someone who knows exactly what I'm talking Maybe you're wearing a handmade wardrobe yourself. Maybe you've sewn together your garments and are sporting your religious deeds. Or you have felt like your religious deeds fall short and you're left feeling exposed. And so this journey through Romans is exactly for you. It's all about removing our self-made garments and accepting God's wonderful gift his robe of grace. Now, before I begin, I need to warn you and even remind you, our friend, the Apostle Paul, is not concerned with making friends and influencing people. His first three chapters 
are kind of like going 12 rounds with a boxer. He wants to make sure we understand the problem before he gives us the solution. The problem is identified in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The problem is that our sin, our ungodliness, our unrighteousness, as Paul calls it, separate us from God. We incur the wrath of God. When we consider this, we need to remember that the wrath of God is not like the wrath of men. Uh, We grow angry because somebody, I don't know, cuts us off in traffic. We feel overlooked or neglected or or cheated. But God's anger has nothing to do with, with how he feels about himself. It has to do with how he feels about his children. And when he sees disobedience that leads to self-destruction, what kind of father would feel anything except anger and wrath? God loves his children, but he hates what destroys them. Call it a holy hostility, a righteous hatred of wrong. Whatever term you use, the question is not how could a loving God be angry, but the question is how could a loving God feel anything less? So as humans, we're faced with the problem that our sin separates us from God. It it rightly incurs God's wrath. This is the dilemma confronting every single person who has ever lived. Interestingly, though, we don't respond to the same problem of wrath or separation from God in the same way. And Paul uses Romans 1 and 2 to delineate the three different ways that we respond to our sin. I hope you find this interesting. I do. First of all, there are one way we respond to our sin is hedonism. Hedonism. Just pretending there is no God and turning pleasure into a God. These people or hedonists live as if there's no truth beyond their perspective, no purpose to life beyond their pleasure, and no consequences, not at all, no consequences for misbehavior. People choose this lifestyle because they claim to believe that no God exists. Oh, this carried no water with the Apostle Paul. He said, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made so that people are, look at this, without excuse. You're telling me you can look at the creation and say there is no God? Paul says creation is God's first missionary. Therefore, the notion that people could look honestly at the world around them and conclude there's no creator is beyond comprehension. Paul continues in verses 21 and 22. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. Their thinking as a result became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. So one response to our sinfulness is just hedonism. A second response to our sinfulness, Paul goes on to describe, is judgmentalism. We compare ourselves with other people. We filter God's grace through our own opinions and dilute God's mercy with our own prejudice. We become like the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son who is so quick to point out how other people are not worthy of receiving the father's love while conveniently overlooking the debt on our side of the ledger. Paul had a stern warning for these people as well. Chapter 2 and verse 1. If you think you can judge others, you are wrong. When you judge them, you're really judging yourself guilty because you do the same things they do. Now, the key word here is judge. It's one thing to have an opinion. It's quite something else entirely to render a verdict. Oh, but how we love passing judgment. I mean, isn't there something smug and self-satisfying 
about donning the robe and stepping behind the bench and slamming down the gavel. Guilty. Judging others is a quick and easy way to feel good about ourselves. It's a convenience store ego boost. After all, when we compare ourselves to others, we can always find a Mussolini or a Hitler or a terrorist and say, I'm better than that person. Of course, the problem is we're never called to compare ourselves with others, but only to compare ourselves with Christ. And by that measure, we all fall short. Well, this leads us to the third way of trying to deal with the problem of being separated from God, and that is legalism, legalism, hedonism, judgmentalism, and now legalism. We use religion and piety as a way to earn our way back to God. This is the approach of a legalist. There are many legalists in many churches. I know I'm a recovering one myself. I'm talking about those of us who have tried to impress people and impress God with our own good works, only to realize that our works fall short. We have our own monogram pew right on the front row, so impressed with our self-righteousness that we can actually get to the point where we see no need for the righteousness of Christ. Now, in Paul's day, a large portion of these legalists in the church in Rome were Jewish believers who were still infatuated with and relying upon the law of Moses. I can almost picture the congregation there in Rome, the Jews on one side, the Gentiles on the other, and apparently these Jews were just pretty self-satisfied and smug. And I can picture them as Paul is reading And he's pointing out the sins of the hedonists. And he's pointing out the failures of the judgmentalists. And the Jews are thinking, yeah, those Gentiles, those Gentiles, if only they could get their act together. Amen, Paul, preach it, they say. And then, watch the apostle Paul pivot In chapter 2 and verse 17, he pokes a finger in their puffy chests and he says, watch this, folks. What about you? Mm. You call yourself a Jew? I told you, he never read that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. (laughs) You trust in the law of Moses? You brag that you're close to God? He goes on to say, you brag about having God's law, but you bring shame to God by breaking his law? He takes things even further by getting into what we perceive to be this curious conversation about circumcision that would make no sense to you if you didn't know he was speaking to Jews in Rome who treasured circumcision as a symbol that made them better than other people. They misunderstood it entirely. Circumcision was God's way of saying that he will cut away anything that would bring pride to people. And no place he won't go to call people to himself. So Paul shatters that illusion. Verses 28 and 29. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So Paul's point in all this is to tee up the message of grace. Everything in Romans 2, Romans 1 and Romans 2, and even portions of Romans 3 are speaking to that part of us that tries to do what that girl was doing as she hung upside down, suspended by a seatbelt, saying, I'll save myself, I'll save myself. It's an impossibility. Now, if you just read Romans 1 and Romans 2, it's not going to leave you in much of a good mood. That's why I'm so excited for you to be reading Romans 3 through 6 and come back next week as Travis unpacks this powerful presentation, unparalleled presentation of God's grace. Immerse yourself, dear friend, 
in Romans 3, 4, 5, and 6. And if you can't hold back, just keep reading. (laughs) Oh, my goodness, how the Apostle Paul begins to explain grace in a way that we treasure. Because when you get Romans, God gets you. I went to the dentist last Monday. It was, a, it was a checkup. It was just scheduled. Been on the calendar for months. But I began dreading it some two weeks in advance. The reason I began dreading it some two weeks in advance is because I, I, I was having some pain in a tooth. And I know what dentists do. When you have tooth pain, can I get an amen? Amen. I love my dentist. Dr. Sherry is just the very, very best. But I was treating this pain with an Advil every other day, then an Advil every day, and then two or three a day, and then I knew what was coming. I knew what she was going to ask me. I sat there in the chair, and I knew the question was coming. Is everything okay? (laughs) And I'll confess to you, and I'll confess to God. I, for just a moment, thought about lying. (laughs) I did. I thought, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. It'll hurt me, but it won't hurt her. I'll just spend the rest of my life going through Advil. But I confessed the pain. I said, well, somewhere over in here, there's just this radiating pain. She said, hmm. (laughs) Well, and so she began tapping teeth. Ooh, you've had it too, haven't you? (laughs) And she tapped a tooth, that didn't hurt. She tapped a tooth, that didn't hurt. She tapped a tooth, oh. And she said, yeah, there's something going on here. And within 24 hours, we had gotten to the root of the problem. (laughs) As they say, you shall know the tooth, and the tooth shall set you free. (laughs) That wasn't my joke, so don't blame me for it. But my point is, are are you pretending like there is no pain? Really, the Apostle Paul, in these opening words of Romans. He's just tapping teeth, pointing out the folly of trying to say there is no God, pointing out the folly of just living a life by pointing out the sins of others and pointing out the folly of just saying, I can save myself through legalistic or through good works. Maybe he's tapped your tooth today. Maybe you needed a reminder that we all have a problem, a cavity within called sin. And the heart of the problem has always been the problem of the heart. And that is we have turned away from God. But the beauty of our precious Lord is that he's ever ready to receive us back, ever ready at any point to remove our robes of self-righteousness and to wrap around us the wonderful robe of Jesus Christ. My friend, that's called God's great grace. And now as we enter into a time of prayer, I'd like to invite you to welcome the work of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to your heart today. Maybe even whisper a prayer and say, Lord, what is it you need me to learn today? Lord, would you please speak words of mercy over your children? Those dealing with personal issues, those with physical issues, those reeling from these difficult days of the pandemic, those cut off from people they love, those who feel far from you, however, however we find ourselves today. 
would you help us? Help us. And we're so grateful that you do. Continue to please bless this precious church and help us to be a church that proclaims the great grace of our great God. Through Christ I pray and all the church said. Now one reason that we like to celebrate communion each and every weekend is to be reminded of God's grace. Those of you watching online, if you would like to take a moment to get some bread and to to get some either wine or juice, we're going to celebrate communion together. And all, all people are welcome to come. All believers are welcome at the table. We're going to partake of the bread, take, partake of the cup, and they remind us of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for each and every one of us.